welcome to another episode of Coding Secrets. This time I will be looking at the original Sonic the Hedgehog game on the Sega Genesis and explaining how Sega achieved the various effects used in the game. This is the first Coding Secrets video I've made for a game that I didn't work on, so please let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more of me breaking down other people's coding secrets and what other games you'd like to see me tackle. And as always, if you like this kind of content, please consider the like, subscribe, bell ringing action that every YouTuber pleads for. Now, let's get started. Sega! An understanding of the basic Sega hardware is very useful in pulling apart the tricks used in any Genesis game, so let's take a look at the most fundamental aspects of the hardware to see what clues they give us. Pretty much every game on the Sega Genesis will use the following three aspects of the hardware. These are sprites, the foreground layer and the background layer. When these are all combined, you end up with the final image that you see on screen. So if we play the game and turn our focus to the sprite layer, it will highlight several interesting things. You can obviously see Sonic, rings, enemies and pickups, but also things like this bridge. Looking at the final image, you can see that it spans a gap in the foreground and it has to be made of sprites to allow it to move as you walk on it. Moving on, we can see more rings and enemies, rocks, other bridges, and then this strange column. Looking again at the final image, I originally thought it was a section of wall that you can break to reach a secret area, but after looking around some more, I realised that it's only used to add a highlight to the background graphics. Elsewhere in the level, more sprites are used to add shadows to some of the background graphics as well. I'm not sure why they didn't just use background graphics to do the highlights and shadows, but if I had to guess, I'd say it might be because otherwise the number of background tiles needed to cover every combination would get too large. Still, strange though. Further down the level we get to this big chunk of floating ground. It's much easier to see why this is made of sprites, as it has to break into pieces when it's stood on. Nothing really much different around the rest of the level, more rings, enemies, pickups and moving platforms. But now let's turn our attention to the background layer. This effect is something you'll see in a lot of Genesis games. The background looks like it's made of several different layers containing the sky, mountains and water all overlapping each other. However, the hardware can only render one full screen of background, and so Sega used different scroll speeds to create the effect of multiple layers. If you look closely, you can see that the faster moving rocks in the middle don't actually overlap either the mountains or the water, so no overlapping screens are needed to produce the effect, just clever vertical graphic placement. The water is scrolled at ever increasing speeds as the screen renders downwards, giving the effect of perspective. Incidentally, to make the water look like it's rippling and the waterfalls flowing, four colours are cycled to give the illusion of movement, without actually needing any animation frames, thus saving memory and potentially very valuable processor cycles. Talking of water, let's jump further into the game, the labyrinth zone to be precise. Here we can see water rippling up and down on the screen. This is an effect that became very common, but seemed very hard to do at the time. Firstly, the flickering waves at the top of the water are sprites, but if we slow down the frame rate we can see that only every other sprite is drawn each frame. Why would Sega do that? Well, firstly, there is a hardware limitation that you can only have one screen width of sprites drawn on any given horizontal line. If the top of the water was all sprites and then Sonic jumped in, that would be more than one screen's width, and some of the sprites would not be drawn on that line, leading to an effect called sprite tearing. Here's an example of sprite tearing where you can see the lines disappearing as the hardware tries to draw too much on a single line. So by only drawing half of the sprites each frame, you can avoid this problem. Secondly, the Sega Genesis didn't have any ability to draw transparent sprites, so flickering them very quickly could give the illusion of transparency which is obviously useful when trying to draw water. Now to get the illusion that we are looking through water and everything behind the water is a different colour, Sega are using what is known as a horizontal interrupt. Basically this allows video RAM or colour RAM to be updated on a specific scanline of the render. So Sega sets up a horizontal interrupt to occur at the exact position on the screen that the top of the water is calculated to be. At that point they change all the colour palettes, there are four palettes in total, to be underwater versions, allowing the backgrounds and sprites to look darker and bluer or greener and this is copied into Color RAM. The problem is that when one of the color palettes is changed on the Genesis, a graphical corruption of 16 dots appears on screen. So to change all the palettes at once creates a noticeable 64 dot glitch on the screen. In fact, it's present all the time at the bottom of the screen if you run the game on original hardware. I actually used this glitch to create amazing 256 color images on a standard Genesis. I'll leave a link here and in the description if you want to see how that was done. But in the case of this water, that is the third reason that Sega are flickering the water sprites. It helps cover up the palette changing glitch. The last thing we'll look at is the special stage rotation effect. I remember being really impressed when I first saw this effect. 
If we remove the distracting foreground and background layers, we can see that everything that actually rotates is all drawn as sprites. So you have to be careful to design the level so there aren't too many sprites on a given line, or that more than 80 sprites aren't drawn on screen at once, as that's the most the hardware can support. If we look really carefully, we can see that the only sprites that actually rotate are the squares. Everything else doesn't rotate. To get the squares to rotate, they just store an animation of one square rotating 90 degrees and have that stored in video RAM. They only need 90 degrees because it's a square and so has a rotational symmetry of order 4. Here's a screen dump of the video RAM. You can see the frames laid out here in 8x8 tiles. To get the different coloured squares, they just draw them using one of the four palettes. They have to use sprites so they can line them all up at the different angles needed to make the screen look like it's rotated. Analyzing the video RAM, it looks like they have 15 frames of animation to rotate the square 90 degrees, at which point it can repeat, which allows them to have the screen at one of only 60 angles, which is why the rotation looks so jerky. They probably limited it to this so that they didn't run out of video RAM, but as only one animation image is used for every square for any screen update, they could have just downloaded the image they needed per frame. That way they could store all the animation frames compressed on the cartridge in ROM and then decompress them to RAM for the special stage. Once in RAM, they could just download the one frame needed for any given angle. I would imagine this would allow them to at least double the number of angles in the same amount of ROM, and if they had enough spare cartridge space, they could have made it super smooth. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this brief look at the effects Sega used to create the original Sonic the Hedgehog, and I'll see you next time for more coding secrets.